I think on the continent the, um, the Huguenots were persecuted and so they you know, emigrated to countries and one of them was ours. And so in different parts of our country these people came over with great skills. There were silk makers and other, and particularly here, lace making. And they brought those skill, skills with them as opposed to be able to make a living. And um, that's how I think and I believe, through historical records, that that's how it came to be. Years ago, I'm going back, years. <laughs> we used to go to a lace day and different lace groups would have tickets on sale for the Aragon. And it must have been oh, 20, 30 years ago, I suppose, that we used to go to the Aragon lace day. And then a few years ago, we decided to join. I went to Elstow Craft Centre to learn and uh, my teacher was, uh, at the time, Eunice Arnold, and then um, June Day, and it must have been just word of mouth, because I went to the original meeting at Manda College, Pam and I, as you know, we're both original members, so yeah, heard about it straight away <laughs> as it was being formed. I started with Torsion again and then went on to Bedfordshire and we used to have quite a lot of tutors come to teach us different laces. We had flower lace, continental laces, so we had a wide spectrum of different kinds beside the Bedfordshire, Buckinghamshire, Honiton. Oh dear, Junius was a character. She was broad Northamptonshire, so some of the sayings that she came out with, Midduk. She wrote a book, Teach Yourself Torsion Lace. It was written for people who didn't know anyone to help them. It is pin by pin instructions for, I think it's six patterns, complete with the prickings in the book. She really was the leading light early on. I remember Eunice very well. I was really quite friendly with Eunice. She was a very uh, bright character. But I think Margaret Hamer was the instigator of Aragon in the first place. She was a teacher as well and she joined the main um, guild, uh, the Lace Guild, and she was one that really wanted to promote it. So I think she was, one of, well, at least one of the main people to start up Aragon. Initially, we met at Mark Rutherford, Mark didn't Rutherford. we? But then, um, once the group was formed, we um, then started to meet all over the place. Sort of went around all North Bedford villages, um, village halls, so that we could draw people in from those areas. And uh, yeah, it was very successful. We did Bedfordshire with Margaret Turner. We did mixed continental laces with. Patricia, we did Bruges. That was the sort of in thing then. But we had a good, you know, 100 to start with at the beginning. There was a lots of um, people interested. I wanted to do something after my second son was born. Evening classes were the only options. And I thought, well, let's give it a, give it a go, give Lace a go. And I'm pleased I did. It's got me into so many situations. You can lose yourself in a day quite easy on a new pattern. I have just spent the day making a piece of lace from an old pattern that was sold at E.P. Rose. It's got E.P. Rose price ticket on it for sixpence. And to work out how to do it, I mean, part of it was easy because it was just net ground, but sorting out the head side took a bit of thinking about. I think it was just something about the technique of it as well, because doing something with your hands and, and it was quite logical lace, I think, and I think it, yeah, it's stimulating, isn't it? So that's one of the things, apart from the beauty of it. I mean, I was a learner, so I didn't think my lace was beautiful at the time, but it was, it was the doing of it that was the important thing. Obviously, I remember bobbins being sold in EP rows, but they weren't as prominent in there. They were sort of 
tucked away under the counter. But they were bobbins that were made by Harris's of Cockermouth. Braggins obviously were the main suppliers of lace making equipment and they also bought in lace to resell. Audrey Sells, who lived in Clifton, she ran the department in Braggins and when she retired and Braggins reorganised their shop, they advertised for someone to take over the lace department and Beryl Ricketts, who she was then, Beryl Watts as we know her now, um, took over the lace making department. And when Braggins decided they'd were going to discontinue it there, Beryl took a partner, June Day, and they opened a top room at Cherub Antiques in Newnham Street and it was called Bedford Lace. They ran lace making classes in the church hall on the other side of the road and then when Vic who owned Cherub Antiques uh, sold his business they acquired the shop and they took the whole shop. Julia Johnson's Bacchus, which was opposite the Market Square, Belfast Linen. It was full of obviously linen and stuff like that, where you used to, if you wanted something special, you used to go there to buy. It was a lovely old shop. But it was this basket of bobbins that was in the gangway as you passed, so you could see it quite clearly. There were bone and wooden ones. They did have wooden ones as well and lots of them, not just a few, the big, big baskets of, of them. It was a very nice shop. It was yeah, just really nice. It didn't seem overcrowded, it was just spacious and smelt nice. The majority of everything, from a reel of cotton to bedding. And I remember they had, the cash register was in an office and they put the money in a a tube and pulled a handle and it used to shoot across the ceiling. <laughs> I remember that, yes. But it was full of stuff. When I say full, it was full. Arabelle came to a lace day at Addison Centre. She explained that she had got a commission. She wanted to make this piece of lace to hang on one of the bridges. Oh, I thought, yeah, well. But in the end, she wasn't allowed to hang anything on one of the bridges. And she found number one, St Paul's Square. But Arabelle couldn't make lace. So she went and spent time with Marilyn, our secretary. And Marilyn taught her the basic stitches and then brought Arabelle to my house where we discussed the type of stitches that could be used and where they could be used and what materials could be used. So samples were made in rope, just a cloth stitch and a plait. Arabelle had this idea of the running river going from top to bottom. And because Bedfordshire lace has got spiders, it would have a spider in the middle. And the petals, plaits, whatever one wants to call them, in the four corners. All the windows had to be measured because they were different. The upstairs ones are smaller than the other two floors and she advertised for people to get involved with the project, which meant that we had some quite new people to teach how to do the basic stitches. And they went into creative arts in Midland Road and 
made their pieces and we finished up with 14 window panels. Well, Bedford and Bamberg were twinned and it was decided, I don't know who decided in the end, but we'd do a, a big lace picture of Bedford. And so my mum sketched the picture. Debbie Muller translated it into lace. Most of the members had a go, um, making a bit of the bridge or a bit of the church or whatever. Um, and then it was presented. To make for a purpose is the great thing. You know, not just to make lace for itself, is to make something that you can enjoy or give as a present or a useful thing or nowadays anyway. I mean, before we used to make long, lots of strips and things like that. But I think it's nice to make something, an article of some kind. A place that is just set for the lace makers, where it could be workshops, museum type items, display, just a proper home for Bedfordshire Lace. So we'd like to get children involved, wouldn't we? That's our aim, one of the aims, I think, of Aragon is to promote our lace making to the younger generation who are gonna come and bring it forward. I, I think that's the great thing. Obviously, I hope it continues. I mean, it's a lovely hobby. And like we, we were chatting earlier, you know, there's so many opportunities to be involved with different things, like demonstrating in the high street, the river festival, church fates, and you, you meet school fates, and, and you meet all sorts of people. And, and yeah, it's, it's a lovely, a lovely thing to be involved with. And I just hope that that continues. I hope that Ar Aragon will continue for, you know, years to come. And let, thanks to Karen, our new chairperson, who is promoting it, you know, it's great to hear that. Because a few years ago, the numbers did go down to around 30, which looking now, we're over 100, aren't we? And it's just great to know that. And I'm sure it will thrive from now on. It's been great in our lives, Aragon, and we're so glad it's still continuing.